Hello, and welcome to Retail X's week of webinars, the e-commerce world review. Today, we're going to be covering the Global 2020 report, and I'm delighted to have an excellent panel with me here today to do just that. My name is Caroline Baldwin. I'm a freelance business journalist, and with me today, I have Ludovica. She's the retail analyst at Retail X. I also have Simon, the CEO at Ascendia UK, and I have Neele, the co-founder at Clayboon. So over the next 35 to 40, 45 minutes, we are going to be taking a broad look at online shopping trends across the globe. Ludovic is going to kindly take us through a presentation, picking out some of the most interesting insights. Um, I'm, I'm really excited to get stuck into this. It's, um, I don't feel like we have enough time to get into all the different topics that we could possibly look at when you're looking at the globe of online retail. Um, but I'm sure we're going to see how COVID's impacted and many other trends. So we want to make this um, a conversation. Um, so our panel, our panelists, um, Simon and Nile and I might ask you, Ludovica, um, some questions as you go along and equally um, Simon and Nile be prepared for me to ask you your thoughts and your expertise on this as we go along. Before um, I hand over the um, the reins to Ludovica, um, perhaps all three of you might like to um, introduce us yourselves to our audience. Um, Ludovica, start, let's hear from you first. Okay, thank you, Caroline. Like it was super nice. And uh, my name is Ludovica. I'm a research analyst at Three Day Lex, taking care of all the reports, country and regional ones. Super, and uh, Nile. I'm one of the co-founders at Clevo, um, and yeah, that's it. And what, tell us a little bit about Clevo then to our audience. We are, um, we are specialized in machine learning and linguistics, mm -hmm. and we are on a mission to democratize retail, particularly the discovery experience in retail, to uh, provide relevant platform for all retailers in the world to ensure that the customers or the shoppers actually can find what they want. So everything we do surrounds sort of, you know, discovery and the experience related to discovery specific to retail only. Super, and uh, Simon, finally. Hello, I'm Simon. I'm the CEO of Ascendia UK. Um, we, uh, we provide e-commerce packets and parcel solutions to a range of UK retailers distributing across the world to all of the major e-commerce markets. Fantastic. So a variety of expertise here today. Um, and um, yes, as I say, we don't have a lot of time. So um, Ludovica, I'm going to hand over straight to you. Let's get uh, uh, cracking on the presentation. Okay, thank you, Caroline. So the countries highlighted for this report represent e-commerce market at different stages of maturity and adoption. The global internet usage is set at 65% and we saw an increase in growth since 2015. When it comes to online shoppers, North America leads the ranking, followed by Europe, Asia and South America and the Middle East. Africa ranks at the last position for its shoppers. When uh, we can see that the leading countries in shoppers are UK, Germany and France, while Canada, UA and E and Spain uh, less countries in the top 10 ranking. There's quite a difference. So, sorry, just popping back to no, that no, slide. 91% yeah. on in the UK versus 64% in Spain. Is that is there anything you can um what, what what is it that we're doing right in the UK, do you think? Uh well, uh usually it's the population that is just more digitized and uh it is easier for UK consumers or UK population just to access the internet. It's more a daily basis uh action actually. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, if we move on uh, to Africa, uh, we see that throughout Africa, the digital economy is on rise. So with internet users projected to reach almost 50% of the population in 2020. Of those internet users, around 35% are expected to shop online in 2020. The majority of internet use is on mobile phones, 62% of market share. Facebook is the leading social media hub, followed by Pinterest. B2C e-commerce turnover of the uh, African countries we analyzed is predicted to reach around $30 billion in 2020. We can see that in, e in Egypt, the most payment methods used are cash, cards, and bank transfer. 
In Ghana, the most prevalent e-commerce problems are customer service, followed by delivery and logistics and product quality. In South Africa, the credit card is the main payment method, followed by debit card and bank transfers. Uh, so Nilay, what, uh, what lessons have we learned building a global technology that you could share with retailers and other technology providers? Thank you for asking that question. Um, we, are, we are still on a journey, but I'm not sure from what, what we have learned so far. Um, I mean, for us, what we have definitely learned is that actually customers who are kind of retailers in our case, they, they do provide you know, really invaluable insights to us um, if we are ready to listen and adapt. So I mean, like in case of Clevu, for example, there is not a single feature in Clevu that is not being used by at least one customer. Um, so that's that's kind of one of the key lessons we have kind of you know learned and it was sort of in our DNA. Um, other thing that we are a Finnish company, uh, but we are a Finnish global company, uh, coming from Nordic and, and being you know very diverse from day one. And it's not just diversity that it, it's something that we are now seeing the benefits of it. And we speak over 11 languages within our team. And it, it, companies spend millions of dollars to actually patch up diversity and kind of, you know, to run programs and so on. For us, it came inherent. Like from day one, we are diversity of everything. And it's not just, just about taking care of gender diversity or cultural diversity. It is about diversity of everything, a talent diversity, diversity of ideas and, and so on. Um, and then kind of the third important aspect is that the mission, you need to have a cause. And I think our cause is to democratize retail discovery. Um, and and that's, that's the cause we are kind of, you know, working towards. And I think for any other company out there, I think it's very important to have a cause. Um, and finally, I go back to the first point that I, I raised that to build a company, I feel that if you solve customers problem, then they will solve your problem. So, you know, they, they would solve your problem as, as, as much as and as long as you keep solving their problems. Of course, I just want to pick up on, on that when you were saying that building the identity and, and, and all that, it, it, are you finding, are your clients finding this very difficult today in the world of Amazon when, you know, you can get something delivered to your house in, in, a, in a click of one button and just standing out. Surely the, the trends that we've just seen already and that Ludovic is going to talk us through just shows that more and more people are shopping online. Therefore, there is more competition out there. So how do you stand out and build a brand identity like that? Absolutely. And, and as you would, would imagine that um, we are in the age of kind of, you know, some people say it as Amazonification, mm -hmm. right? And, but when you, when you look at the data of the retail, you know, Amazon is by far, you know, the conversion data that you see, like for a typical retailer, and I'm talking about highly mature, even global, you know, top 1,000 and 10,000 retail index. If you look at that across the board, Amazon, this is not very recent data, but still very relevant that Amazon commands about 72% conversion rate when Prime is used. And without Prime, they command 13 to 15% site conversion rate. I have hardly met any retailer, online retailer, who would kind of, you know, boast above 5% of site conversion rate. Um, and and the, the reason is, one of the key reasons there is the, is the discovery, is at the core of Amazon. And the innovation gap from Amazon to the rest of the, most of the retailer in mid and upper mid market at least, is so huge and it requires so much investment that you know, it, it, it's impossible to, to catch up for a retailer individually. And, and that's the reason we have taken this mission of democratizing discovery for all retailers. Um, how our identity is kind of revealed through our customers. So we keep kind of helping our customers. And, and one of the things that I have learned that some retailers, when they come to us and say that I want to have the same experience as, for example, Amazon, when it comes to search, that's one of the products we sell. And we usually say, do not copy Amazon because Amazon has over 3 billion products globally. 
and you have 20,000 products in your store. You are a specific vertical. You are you know, selling only outdoor furniture, for example, so, or fashion. So it's important that you don't just kind of, you know, elude it to just copy, you know, certain experience or Amazon's experience or for that matter, other experience as well, but rather really understand your customers, your shoppers, and sort of build that kind of true customer loyalty and we are seeing tremendous evidences in the in the market that those who actually create that customer loyalty, uh, mm-hmm. they do keep kind of you know business coming to them as well. And and because of pandemic and so on, the access to the physical retail being so little available, I think that that trend has just continuously growing. And finally, just to very briefly to add is this A/B test. We call it meaning kind of you keep testing and kind of you know harness the power of AI, but keep testing, ensure that you don't intrude into the customer's privacy and experience, but keep A-B testing, keep testing what works, what doesn't work, because for every store, um, I feel that they would have their own journey. And and as long as they kind of stick to the basics of building customer loyalty through, you know, providing really good, delightful experience, um, it is possible to be successful even with Amazon being one of the players. And Amazon has done a tremendous job. So I think there is so much to learn uh, and, uh, you know, utilize that knowledge. Fantastic. I wonder if um, a few of those trends that you've touched on is going to be coming up in the next few slides. Um, Ludovica, do you want to talk us through um, some of the some of the next trends? Yes, of course. Uh, we're moving now to Asia, which is home to both emerging and mature e-commerce market. In mm-hmm. fact, we see that internet use is fairly high, with almost 60% of the population using the internet in 2020. Just over 50% of the online population shopped online in 2020. Asia is, in fact, one of the continents with mobile device market share is higher than desktop, mm-hmm. with 50% compared to 47%. Social media usage differs from country to country, uh, as some social media are not accessible in some countries. With the largest population, Asia is also, as the B2C e-commerce market, really, really high. We see that in China, the most payment methods used by consumers is WeChat Pay, Alipay, and e-payment services. In Indonesia, the main reason cited by um, shoppers for online shopping are promotional ads on social media, avoiding the crowd to to COVID-19 and the need to buy something. And when it comes to cross-border trade, the main destination from South Korea is the USA. So uh, Simon, when it comes to sustainability, how can global logistic companies respond to that? It's it's a good question. Um, I, I think what we've seen over the last decade has been just an increasing level of importance on the topic. So, uh, you know, will the USA be in the Paris Accord or now, not in the Accord and then back in the Accord again? Um, obviously this year in the UK, we have the United Nations Conference around the environment. So I think I think at a global level, a macro level, it's just become uh, a bigger topic with a great level of awareness. And, and I think a political will um, to, to act more decisively, which is positive. Um, I think that has a quite a profound effect on the whole industry because of course, we're all consumers, we're all shoppers, and so our requirements on our e-commerce <clears throat> retailers and, and, and stores is that they start to act more responsibly and come up with environmentally friendly solutions. And in turn, the partners, the logistics partners of those e-commerce retailers then clearly have a responsibility. And so there's different things that I think are going on. Um, certainly within the e-commerce retail space, there are lots of discussions that we have with our customers, uh, lots of big brands who are wrestling with the challenge of to have one one central global hub to distribute and fulfil product uh, across the globe, or whether to move to more local hubs where obviously you have to have multiple SKUs, but you can get closer to consumers, maybe cut, cut a little bit that final mile carbon footprint. So that's a big topic for e-commerce retailers. And for the logistics industry, when you're moving things from A to B across the globe, clearly at the moment we're carbon heavy as an industry. And so Um, We have responsibilities, certainly for measurement uh, and mainly offsetting. We do a lot of offsetting, investing in wind farms as an organisation, as a sendia. Um, But then there's lots of quite creative things that are happening within the the whole delivery industry, whether that's interactive technology with consumers to minimise re-deliveries, which are kind of wasted miles, 
uh, or whether a conversation about consolidated delivery to to lockers or post offices or pickup points to try and get that volume into one place to minimise the amount of trucks. Uh, and obviously for domestic networks, um, some great initiatives around electric vehicles and, and small city centre depots. So I think it's one of those topics where we're probably just scratching the surface, but there's there's a global momentum now, I would say, that e-commerce retailers and their partner logisticians like have to respond to. So interesting. Okay, uh, we move now to Europe, which is the most connected continent, with almost 90% of the population having access to the internet. Adoption of online shopping is high in Europe, with more than 60% of internet users having shopped online in 2020. B2C turnover um, is expected to increase in great part due to COVID-19's positive impact on e European e-commerce adoption. In France, the most preferred payment method, um, delivery method, is delivery at home, followed by delivery at relay points and collect at stores. We see that in Italy and Spain, the most used methods is line payment, followed by credit card and prepaid cards or vouchers. If we then move to the Middle East, we see that e-commerce markets found in the Middle East benefit from high levels of internet use and mobile device access. In fact, internet use is extremely high in the Middle East, with more than 80% of the population having accessed the internet in 2020. Available data reveals that online shopping to be lower than expected with such high levels of internet use, with only 45% of the population having shopped online. Mobile devices are the most predominantly used for accessing the internet with 60% of total market share. In Qatar, the most payment method used is cash on delivery. In Saudi Arabia, cross-border e-commerce share focuses on China and the USA, while in the United Arab Emirates, cross-border focuses on the USA and um, UK. So, uh, Nilay, when in the Middle East countries, consumers used to prefer cash and delivery payment methods, will, do you see this changing over time or um, will stay the same? I think it will change. <laughs> it will evolve because um, what we have seen um, in some of the emerging economies they have literally skipped some of the traditional means of payments and deliveries that we are used to here in the West. So, for example, in case of India, we have observed that shoppers have literally skipped even the payments, like a traditional card and, and, and payment methods, but gone directly to mobile-based payments only, right? So it's a completely kind of a next generation in a way, which is kind of truly mobile commerce, we call it, and 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 in terms of the uh, delivery as well, I think that that sort of changes with the density of the population and and the demand. Uh, but this cash on delivery seems to be very kind of a common pattern among many of the emerging um, economies. At least uh, that's what we are uh, observing. That's interesting. Um, Simon, do you, what, what's your thoughts in this area? Do you agree? I do agree. <clears throat> and I think um, I mean, one of the, the, the fascinating things I think about the Middle East is, is the growth. So mm -hmm. it's one of the, fast, in, in our view, it's one of the fastest growing markets in terms of online shopping. And I think just to take the cash on delivery example, for me, it's not only um, something that's a little bit not unique, but it's kind of a bit niche for the region, certainly when you compare with delivery preferences here in Western Europe. And so I think it's very easy when you're sitting in in London or somewhere, and, and you assume that the whole world operates in the same way that you do. And so certainly domestically here, we don't talk about cash on delivery. It's not kind of a discussion topic, but clearly it is uh, still at the moment um, uh, in, in the Middle East. And for me, I think there's, there's a kind of a broader lesson, which certainly we try to take from a logistics perspective, which is, I think, the kind of the days of saying, well, getting something may to be with tracking, with a good level of reliability at a, a decent price, that's kind of just the, the basic entry level thing. And I think the important thing, especially for cross-border commerce, for e-commerce retailers uh, coming out of the UK or coming out of uh, the US, 
is to recognise the fact that in each region, consumers have certain preferences. And it's important when you're looking at cross-border distribution to try and come up with solutions that recognise that consumers in region A may want something different to region B, and it may not be the same as the consumers in your own home market. And that's the bit which I think uh, is a bit of a weakness within the cross-border uh, distribution business overall. And I think it's it's a way that, as logisticians, I think we have to up our game a bit to say, well, for deliveries to the Middle East, even cross-border, you know, COD at the moment should be available, even if it wouldn't be on normal mm-hmm. so in the UK stable of, of products. And, and that's something that certainly we've seen some of the more advanced e-commerce retailers in the UK, they're certainly starting to look at that kind of local, global feeling to to distribution services. And I think that's a trend that the Middle East is a great case study of, but there's other examples in other regions of of the world. You mentioned mentioned France just the previous slide. I mean, it's one of our core markets. It's our biggest destination. And, of course, delivery to a a store or to a locker or to a consolidation point in France is much more popular than in the UK. And so it's it's kind of fundamental for the French delivery to have a home delivery and a Pudo delivery and to have a good range of options. So it's another example of just how to localise things, even when you're talking about cross-border. So it's, key, I think. it's the importance of doing your homework, of course, if you wanted to go into these other countries and potentially working with a partner like yourself, who, um, if you don't have time to go into all the nitty gritty into the various countries, um, you'll be the ones that will know what what works in in each and um yeah it's 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 quite important because there are so many differences that we're all seeing just from this this presentation yeah 100 100 percent. i mean we um we try to make sure that when we're looking at distribution markets one of our jobs is to really explore the markets and to understand those consumer mm-hmm. needs so that then we can help our, our our partners and our e-commerce customers to say well in this country maybe consider this or maybe consider that uh, depending on the local needs. It's 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 kind of our job to, to try and do that to advise uh, advise our customers, 100%. It's very complex. Um, Ludovica, where are we going in the world now? <laughs> we are tra- traveling to North America, which is considered a mature market, uh, having very internet uh, usage per- penetration, but also uh, e-shoppers is quite high. The most commonly used devices for internet access are still desktop computers and also mobile devices. Out of these countries, the USA is a powerhouse of e-commerce. However, uh, home to Amazon, the most bigger e-commerce marketplace spreading throughout the world. When it comes to delivery options, Canadian consumers have purchased more items to take advantage of a minimum spend free delivery option, followed by positive delivery experience. In Mexico, the most used payment method is credit card, followed by debit card and e-wallet. And uh, fast shipping speed ranks first in the US shoppers' positive e-commerce experience, followed by an easy delivery process and good information about the products. So, uh, Simon, how do you cope with customs duties and deliveries in the USA? That's a good question. Um, <laughs> so I think, I think the US, um, and again, just looking at it a little bit from a European perspective, one of my big lessons over the last 10 years has been, if you look at the US as a country, you almost don't do yourself any favours. And again, stating the obvious, it's such a big place. And you look at each state, each state often has the, Um, the population, the GDP, the square metrage or square footage of a European country. And so one of the the ways to look at the US market is to to consider the fact that it is a continent, not just just a country. And once you do that, from a logistics point of view, you you change your mindset a little bit. So um, you you talk about customs, there are three different ways of getting things into the US in terms of customs clearance. So you have to make a choice between price and service. Um, For cross-border, uh, it's actually relatively straightforward because the threshold uh, where you start paying VAT and duty is high. So for the vast majority of, I guess, global e-commerce, business to consumer, if we're speaking of uh, apparel, uh, fashion, electronics, books, and so on and so forth, it doesn't become an issue about payment of duty and taxes. It's a question of customs clearance. And um, most logistics companies should offer the three different types of clearance where you can trade between, between price uh, and speed. And then more generally, I guess, getting into the US, taking into account it's a very big place, is, is to understand you have to get close to the consumers. So 
you need at least two entry points, maybe three, I would suggest up to five. Um, there are a range of middle mile providers that do the heavy lifting to get it towards final mile consumers. And a bit of a, a nuance of the US market is that whilst the big US integrators and some local heroes certainly are starting to move aggressively into the home delivery space, um, the vast majority is still delivered by, by the USPS. Uh, and so I guess at a macro level, when looking at cross-border into the US, my key learning is it's not a one-size-fits-all market. It very much depends on that balance between uh, price and speed um, because you have to configure all of those options around customs clearance method, entry point, number of entry points, middle mile providers, final mile product chosen for distribution. There's lots of different variables and, and you have to really, in our experience, you have to really configure that uh, in the detail because each retailer, each, co- each com- e-commerce retailer has, has slightly different needs. Goodness, a uh, lot to think about in the, the North American region then. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. But, but a huge market. And of course, um, it, it goes without saying that um, you know, the, the US-Canada trade lane is, is one of the biggest in the world. I think most people know that. But of course, just the um, ability of having a big English-speaking population makes the US a hugely attractive destination, certainly for, for UK, uh, UK retailers. Mm-hmm. It's, it's within our top three destinations um, for that reason. It's, once you put aside the, you know, the complexity of air freight and customs data on those things, um, it's actually a relatively easy market from a UK e-commerce perspective to get into because you don't you don't tend to have so much of a language barrier as going into a, a other places where where clearly there's work to be done on on translation and so on and so forth. Great, thank you. Um, and if we move on with our journey, we will end up in South America, which is home to its own marketplace. Headquartered in Argentina, Mercado Libre has consistently outrun Amazon in the line marketplace run. More than 70% of the population has access to the internet, primarily from desktop devices. Of this share uh, of the population, almost 50% shopped online. The most preferred payment method uh, in Brazil via mobile is credit card, followed by Boleto Bancario and digital wallet. The preferred delivery method in Chile is shipping uh, and then also pick up in store. In Argentina, the main reasons to shop online are because it is simple and easy, followed by availability and the possibility to receive the purchase at home. So Nilay, do you think consumers will miss the in-store shopping experience because we saw that uh, in Chile, they prefer to pick um, to pick up in store. So do they, consumers will miss the in-store shopping experience? Do you miss it? I do, <laughs> I do, I do, because I do not have the same feeling of uh, going into a store and have all the time I want to try on clothes or <laughs> just walking around. So I do. I think it's an evolution. Um, in my personal view, the offline retail will embrace a lot more online experiences or digital experiences. Something that the trend had already started in a very good pace just before COVID. So you going to the store, I think as a, as a shopper, I think in the future, you're more likely to actually use the digital experiences within the store that would then seamlessly connect with your online shopping as well. On the other hand, I think online shopping is embracing a lot more offline experiences you know, it is not uncommon now that you would see that book a video consultation with you in the store if you are buying a furniture, for example. So somebody is actually, you know, taking you in the warehouse or the store and actually showing you the furniture. You're talking to a human. They would advise you. They would see your, you know, how kind of living room. And then they would say, ah, okay, this particular sofa might be more relevant. Now we're going to send you the link which you can kind of further observe. And then you could have an app through augmented reality. You can kind of see how it looks on your living room. So I think it's a combination. I feel 
online stores and online retail will have to embrace a lot more offline experiences so that what you miss and I miss as a shopper is compensated. Whereas the offline stores will have to embrace a huge amount of digital experiences and also partly social kind of you know experiences that they need to bring there for you not to miss the digital experience that you are used to when you are actually you know doing online shopping. So I think it's yeah, it, it's gonna evolve. I think that's how mm -hmm. I see it at least. This area, the merging of those two is is really what fascinates me about this topic. I just think that it you can't just have boring retail on the high street anymore. You know, if I can Ocado zoom my groceries and don't need to leave the leave the store, why would why would I leave my house? Why would I go to the grocery store? But then when I go to New York and go to the, the, the Nike store there, that's, you know, exciting retail. People want to go there and they want to spend time and they want to use their mobile with the store and it's all interactive. Um, yes, but we definitely don't have enough time to probably go into <laughs> that or this webinar. We'll need a whole separate one. But um, yeah, really, yeah. really interesting way of describing that, Nile. Thank you. Thank you. So the last part of our uh, webinar is about COVID. And I think it's better to ask our experts what is the main changes they see and uh, what they see in the long run instead of reading the graphs that uh, you can see in the slide. So uh, Simon, what, what, do you see, what do you see in the long run after or during COVID-19? So I think, um, I mean, last, last year, from a logistics and a shopping perspective, just with seismic changes, I, I don't really remember years where it's just been um, so different. And, and I think at its heart, as the world, what we certainly saw when the, when the world went into lockdown, there was just a fundamental shift with late adoption from consumers who perhaps weren't online shoppers, all of a sudden becoming online shoppers because they, they really had no choice. And at the same time, some retailers who perhaps hadn't put a huge focus on uh, e-commerce actually saying well we really need to because our stores are closed and so when you when you put together that supply and demand and that kind of what we call what I call a leapfrog effect on the on, on the e-commerce uh, penetration of overall retail so what we then saw and what our industry saw was um, just a huge uplift in e-commerce volume both in domestic markets and cross-border uh, I mean certainly last May after most of the countries had started to go into lockdown, we were doing more volume globally in May than we'd done in November and December the year previous, which of course is the, the busy, the busy period. And, and it's quite, um, although the circumstances are obviously very difficult and, and terrible uh, for so many people, it did force, I think, a lot of change within how we look at things. Because not only did we see a huge amount of volume suddenly skyrocket domestically and globally. Of course, the other key thing was there's no planes in the sky. Mm -hmm. And so when there's no planes in the sky, there's nothing to put these put these goods into to get them from uh, each of these home markets into these the, the destination markets that you've highlighted in the report. So I think that forced a lot of creativity within the logistics industry around um, different ways of getting things made to be, chartering planes, different entry points, having very agile technology. Technology is such a key part of our business. And I think having the ability to, to sw switch and change um, routes, entry points, final our carriers to just keep maintaining service for obviously the e-commerce retailers, but their customers, that the shoppers, it really forced us to, to think quite differently. Um, so that, that is, that's that been a, a profound effect of COVID on, I would say, the e-commerce industry and for us as logisticians, uh, responding but I think what it means I guess turning for us to look to the future is I don't think we're going to go backwards I, I guess time will tell us hopefully the world gets to a better place over the coming months let, let, let's hope but I think what it means is is that um, that e-commerce leapfrog effect is is probably here to stay and so I think if you're in the e-commerce industry it's a fortunate place to be because I think um, the world is is literally your oyster and I also believe as well that Cross-border is still, for most e-commerce retailers, not the majority part. And so I think hopefully a combination of that COVID bounce plus some of the regulatory things making people turn their heads to other markets should mean that the cross-border opportunities um, 
continue to look uh, even more attractive for, for e-commerce retailers. And obviously that gives us as logisticians the challenge to, to step up and make sure that we've got the right innovations and solutions and agility to deliver those things for them. Fantastic. And Nile, finally, um, just to kind of summarise when it comes to COVID, what's, um, what are some of the impacts that you've been seeing um, from Cleaver's perspective? Yeah, I mean, echoing what Simon said, uh, we also saw a uh, steep increase in the usage of, you know, across the board. We saw the traffic increasing on our customers' sites in terms of using search and, and so on, and their overall GMV had increased as well. I mean, as, as someone said, you know, like necessity is mother of invention. But mm -hmm. how necessity arises, sometimes necessity comes out of turbulence. Um, and and COVID actually also brought turbulence, right, to, to many people's lives and, and businesses. Business has to find ways to survive and thrive. And, and I think, like, just the example we just kind of, you know, touched upon that, you know, something that we were not even thinking about just two years ago that you actually book a video consultation to a furniture store is pretty common now, right? So... Um, we, we are seeing huge number of innovations coming out, and and uh, you know, and at, at least at Clo, we uh, we see that we have to step up also our kind of you know effort into this. We feel that the new ways of shopping, even within online, are emerging, which are not confined to you going to the site and you know write something into the search box or go to the navigation. I think those things are there, but new ways of shopping includes, you know, via different experience that you have with your senses, such as vision. So the, how you actually handle images of the product and somebody taking a picture and you are bringing relevant products to the customer, for example. Voice interactions, you know, interactions via, you know, chat, whether it's via machine or human as well. Uh, providing, you know, many online stores started to see huge spike, for example, after 8 p.m. onto their store, right? So how do you, you know, cope up with that side of scenario from your customer service standpoint as, a, as an online retailer? Many of the consumer brands right, that like direct to consumer brands have emerged as well because the brands like, you know, you mentioned Nike and, and many other brands, I think they we have seen tremendous increase in kind of customer interest in terms of direct to consumer sort of, you know, brands emerging and kind of uplifting their online experiences who were traditionally only relying on the distributor network for them. So that's actually kind of direct brand to consumer is something you are clearly seeing as a, as a trend. And not only just to with the vision to serve those shoppers as a direct brand, but they also want to have that first party data I think data has is the new oil, as they say. So th they want to hold on to that learning of the consumers. They want to learn how the how these consumers are interacting with with my brand. So that, that there's a lot of interest in that area, and and I think social commerce has also increased tremendously uh, over the you know over this COVID uh, situation because communities and people came together in the you know smaller kind of geography, right? Uh, most people, at least, like you know, in the in the UK where I live, um, we started to know our neighbors much better, you know, during this time, and that also increased a lot of, you know, commerce. I think within the localized uh, community as well. So, yeah, I mean, we are seeing these kind of very strong trends. But one of the areas that we continue to focus on is these new ways of shopping, and how we can make the experience kind of richer when it comes to discovery of what I want because there is so much to choose from. <laughs> there, are, there are so many trends that the two of you have pulled out because of COVID. And I'm, it, it's going to be really fascinating, I think, over the next 12 months, as hopefully all these vaccination programmes go as well as they, they have, to see which ones stay and which ones maybe we, we, don't, we don't stay with as we go back to um, whatever the new normal might look like. Um, we have um, run, out, run out of time, but Ludo, before I let you um, just go over to, um, uh, to, to this slide, I just wanted to ask you one very quick question. What, from this 
entire report is the one thing very quickly that surprised you the most? Um, it's it's how COVID impacted uh, different economies, even in the same region. For example, if we see in Asia, Indonesian consumers didn't start buying more and more online with COVID-19. So, uh, and this is a trend we saw only in very, very few countries. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm looking forward to see what it's going to be in 2021 to see if it changed or if there is any new trend. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for that. That's probably a good place for us to wrap up. Um, a huge thank you to um, the three of you for taking part in this today and to our viewers out there for watching. Um, so it's an ambitious week for Retail X this week. They're doing 15 webinars in five days. So I believe we're about halfway through now. Um, so it, it, I advise you all to head back to Retail X's website to sign up for some more in-depth information on, I think we've got some presentations on the UK, Europe, Spain, as well as marketplaces and e-delivery later this week. The next one is uh, today, later today at 3.30, and it will be on a Growth 2000 2020 report in discussion, and we hope to see you then. Um, but uh, until next time, um, everyone, thank you so much again, and uh, to our viewers out there, take care. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.